Hello and welcome to the last of the pre-1914 video lessons. Today we're looking the, oh, at the third of the three crises between 1910 and 1914, which is the Irish question. The usual disclaimer about the fact that this will not include enough specific examples. This is only for the analysis you need to use the K-Drive to find specific examples. So a background to Ireland. Um, Ireland was obviously was an original independent state, though we can use the word state in inverted commas because it was more of a collection of different states as opposed to one big one. And there were a number of invasions, um, with Cromwell being the one of the big one. And what essentially happens is, um, uh, in order to get control over the Catholic majority, there is a transplantation of usually poorer, often Scottish, um, Protestants into our islands. You take them over, and the idea is if you get enough Protestants over there, then um, after a point, it will be much easier to control. What happens instead, though, is there's lots of massacres, insurrections, counter-massacres, and over time, the Protestants tend to gather towards the northeast and to a less extent towards Dublin um, for self-protection, i.e. you're far, more, far less likely to get massacred if you are um, in a community where most people are Protestant and if you're Catholic, vice versa, they tend to concentrate in everywhere else to some extent. And so what we have by the 1800s is a situation where we have a very divided society, as you can see, the proportion of um, uh, Protestants in the, um, uh, on that diagram there in different areas, um, and what we have is essentially the government ruling Dublin as part of the British Empire, as part of Britain even, sorry, um, through Dublin. And in 1801 there's a formal union between the two um, countries, and therefore, much like Scotland and England, there's that mentality that, although it's different, it is indivisible, it is the same. Liberals have been the party of home rule since the 1860s, 1870s, but over time, it starts dropping the idea of home rule. In the 1890s, it makes its last big push for home rule. The House of Lords block it, and therefore there's nothing, a conservative dominated House of Lords block it, there's nothing one can do. Plus, it creates a massive split in the party, whether it's worth spending all the time and effort doing home rule, and therefore, um, to avoid that split getting any worse, the Liberals leave it. So, going into 1910, there is a range of different political opinions about what should happen in home rule. Now it's important to realise that home rule is not independence. Home rule is what, similar to what we might describe as devolution today, where the country is still, will still be part of the British, Great Britain, but would have significant autonomy and powers to run its own affairs for its own parliament. Now, in reality, there is a, it's not as simple as saying X party believes in Y. Now, we can say that Sinn, the Sinn Féin movement is solidly behind complete independence. The Liberal Unionists and the Conservatives, again, very strong part of um, uh, feeling in the sense that um, Ireland is an intrinsic part of Britain, there should be no devolution, etc., etc. It's a big belief that this is the beginning of the end. If you allow Ireland to pull away, then you will have other places pull away, and very quickly England will be a diminished power. But in between, the other party is a little bit more vague. Now, you've got the Irish Nationalists, and they are clearly... Um, more towards home rule. Irish nationalists are a less radical, more um, experienced and, uh, and longer existing group, I shouldn't say they're fairly new in the 1900s, um, uh, who are campaigning for Irish nationalists and nationalism and Irish um, independence. Now they are essentially moderate and so although they kind of, in their end goal was Irish independence, they have a very incrementalist, gradualist approach, and therefore they ask for home rule, but with significant power. They realise if you ask for complete independence, the government's not going to give you that. And so the idea is if you get a very, very good deal of home rule, like home rule with lots and lots of power to Parliament, and almost a symbolic role for the Westminster, then you can use that and either to get complete independence, or you don't need to, because basically you're independent. Now, the Labour Party, I put in brackets, because in reality, they don't have an official position. This is something which isn't really class-based. This isn't something which is very easily put into socialist dogma. And 
Because Labour Party represents a range of opinion from very, very socialist and therefore quite sympathetic to the proto-socialist Sinn Féin and to a lesser extent Irish nationalists, um, and also ideologically look, dislike the idea of imperialism, which Ireland is seen as, you also have the trade unionists and moderates who have that sort of gut cons um, social conservatism we've mentioned before. The working classes are not all social liberals, and so therefore they view Ireland and the empire as a good thing, and then therefore the Irish independence perhaps as a bad thing particularly if they use violence to achieve it. So the Labour Party, essentially being McDonald, avoids having a position on the Irish question to avoid splitting the party. And so although there is a broad basis of range of support, in reality there's not too much active campaigning or effects of this um, overall, which um, arguably isn't great for um, uh, Ireland, but is great for McDonald. Now the Liberals themselves have broadly accepted home rule. Now, obviously, there are variations. Some want less, um, less power to devolve Parliament. Some want slightly more power. But ultimately, they are the party of home rule to a greater or lesser extent. However, as we shall see, they do not want to have the fight over home rule because they know they will alienate certain supporters, particularly some supporters who defected from the Conservatives and Liberal Unionists to join the Liberals. They will um, um, alienate them and probably might lose their votes. So they are, are unwilling to push the home rule question too much. And as well as this, there is a sense of fatalism amongst the Liberals. Um, they do not believe that actually, even if they pass a home rule bill in the House of Commons, the House of Lords will pass it. Now, obviously, this will massively change in 1911, but before that, their sort of excuse for their inertia is the fact that it's ultimately pointless to try and pass any bills on home rule or even consider home rule. And to some extent, the Irish nationalists, being moderates, kind of buy that and kind of get along with it. Okay? They are looking for openings, though, um, where they can take advantage of um, gaps in government weaknesses to get more change. So the arguments for the different groups okay, for home rule and reform are very varied. And in reality, there are no one agrees on why there should be home rule, even if they agree there should be home rule. So the Liberals push for a very limited home rule, the idea of a devolved power, but ultimately the Parliament and the Crown control. Um, this fits in the ideas of compromise and the idea of self-democracy. People are responsible for running themselves. So therefore, the idea that people have the right to have their own Parliament if they are different people. So this really fits in with them. Labour, as mentioned, um, is theoretically home rule, but because of its trade union base and because it's got a strong Presbyterian Scottish base, i.e. the people who were sent over to Ireland um, to transplant the, um, uh, themselves and therefore, and then were systematically massacred over several different occasions, um, then the, uh, by the way, the massacres go both ways. It's not just the Catholics massacre and Protestants. Protestants massacre the Catholics. It's just, everyone is just as massacred as each other. Um, the, um, where was I? I just covered myself. Um, yes, the Labour Party, um, because it has a very strong ILP base, because it has a lot of Presbyterian support and support in the North and from the traditional gut, sort of socially conservative Labour Party members, they decide not to really commit either way. Now, the Irish nationalists want independence, but they see Home Rule as the compromise which is more likely to happen. But because of that, they want more powers to the Parliament. Okay, And their arguments are... We, you know, it's either us or them pointing to Sinn Féin. You might as well compromise with us and give us home rule, otherwise we can't say for how long the radicals and the violence will um, come back. Okay, so their argument is we, you need to work with us and you need to give us moderate reform and we can work with that, otherwise a complete lack of reform would only make violence better. And arguably that's been borne out by the fact that Sinn Féin from the late 1800s increasingly grows um, as a political force. Okay, Sinn Féin are full independents, um, and they they really dr sort of derive from the frustration amongst many Irish people the fact that the Irish nationalists have not really achieved much, and so we see more and more people joining the Sinn Féin movement as opposed to Irish nationalists because Sinn Féin seem to promise a more tangible, more radical, and more significant reform. Irish nationalists have basically been in um, government for about forty to fifty years in and out, and have seemingly achieved nothing. As well as, as, well as this. Um, they um, did not really believe that Britain would ever truly let Ireland go. And so if you have home rule, in reality what will happen is um, 
the um, British were still to control behind the scenes Ireland. And so the only way to avoid the natural British instinct to control Ireland is to completely separate and have independence. As well as that, Sinn Féin is to some extent socialist influenced, um, particularly against the British landowners. So again, there's a full emphasis on removing the land taken by the rich, um, uh, British landowners, but illegally, and giving it to poor um, Catholic peasant farmers, etc., etc., etc. Both the Irish nationalists and Sinn Féin both argue that the Protestants will be perfectly healthy and perfectly happy in the Irish Republic. This differs significantly with the arguments of those who are against it. Essentially, um, the Conservative Unionists, for historical reasons, are instinctively anti-Catholic. Okay. Um, the, although actually in reality the Tory party was founded in defence of Catholicism, it was more about the defence of the king, his Catholicism, not necessarily Catholicism. And they very quickly define themselves as anti-Catholicism um, because they are the party of the Anglican faith. Um, they are all suspicious of anything which makes the Brit um, United Kingdom look less strong, less, less prestigious. And because, again, they are the party of the Anglican state, they are more instinctively protective of Protestants. And because of this, as, as you can see, they will naturally take a very hostile to home rule line because they will be suspicious of Catholic motives, not believe the Catholics, dislike the idea as full stop of losing some control over some of the um, country, and fear almost irrationally the, the Protestants. And they particularly fear that following all the massacres that had previously, if Home Rule happens and the, the protection of the British state, the British army, the British law is suspended, what will happen is the Protestants will get massacred and there'll be massive repression of um, Protestant rights and people, everyone will be forced to follow Catholicism. There's still this lingering sort of very curiously 17th, early 18th century idea that Catholicism equals autocracy. Um, and there's like, you can get into that whole thing of Protestant ethics, of Weber, etc. This is not for this pod podcast, video cast, I think is what we call this. Um, again, as well as this, uh, the um, Conservatives argue that the, if the government gives in to the, the very limited violence of the Catholics, then they will show weakness and this will only lead to socialism spreading, women's rights spreading, etc. Et you know the argument for women's rights thing. We do not give in to terrorists, etc. Um, and as well as this, they argue that the UK government was actually fairer to both sides and the status quo was therefore fairer to both sides then, than that of the, um, if you let a Catholic dominated, because the majority of people in Ireland are Catholic, government rule. So very clearly, therefore, we have two clear, well, two branches of arguments. One is about, what well, free. One is about the idea that it's probably fair that people rule themselves, that's the liberal and labour. Another one is the idea that um, independence needs to happen because, to a greater or less extent, Britain cannot be trusted to um, give full equality. And the arguments against are much more about protecting the Protestants um, and the idea of prestige. Now, you can argue that actually this rhetoric about protecting innocent Protestants is just trying to get the moral high ground, and actually it comes from far deeper anti Catholic and anti losing parts of the country prestige stuff. And that's probably true in certain cases, but never underestimate the strong, at least moral bonds that the Conservatives and the Unionists felt between it um, and loyalty they felt to the Catholic and um, to the Protestants. And this does um, motivate them to a large extent. So this debate is essentially dormant from the 1890s and even for the 1890s there's no real chance to actually succeed. So what happens up until um, 1910 is there is a slight shift in the nature of Irish nationalism. And arguably, this turns Irish nationalism to a far more potent and mass-supported force. It's important to realise that if you think about it, and if you look back at the facts, actually, the majority of Catholics were largely indifferent to um, the uh, cause for nationalism. They liked it, they sympathised, and they would like the idea. But in reality, they did not massively agitate and certainly want to risk their lives for it. Because essentially, under the British rule, um, the government has taken a real step back and there was less of repression and there's less economic hardship and so there's less of things forcing people to go think about how unfair the government is. So what we see with certain Irish nationalists and Sinn Féin is they try, they try desperately to make people believe in Irish nationalism a lot more. 
essentially the logic goes, if the Irish people feel that they are intrinsically different, if they feel that they're different from the British, they feel that therefore they are oppressed people, they are far more likely to sympathise the aims of nationalists. So there's a real push to try and develop a sense of Irish nationalism. There's a massive rise in Gaelic culture, there's a lot of authors at this time writing books about um, the Irish consciousness, Dubliners, for example, etc, etc, etc. There's a rise in Gaelic football and Gaelic, Gaelic sporting associations. And although these have been characterised as insidious means in which to mobilise um, and organise a rebellion, in reality they're much more about cult um, shifting the culture so that in the long term there will be a shift in mentality amongst the Irish. Um, Sinn Féin is created in 1905 to further this idea and also challenge the control of the Irish nationalists of Parliament, in Parliament. Okay? And in reality they will very quickly do very well. That's not because naturally they are amazing. It's because the people, re the, the arguments for justifying why, an Irish, why vote for an Irish nationalists are kind of poor. If you vote for them to have a voice for Ireland and a role for Ireland and home rule, they have not achieved that in 45 years. So what's going to change now? Might as well give Sinn Féin a chance. However, despite this, and this, in these forces for radicalisation, in reality, the majority of Catholics were still relatively loyal to the Crown. Um, the economic circumstances were not bad, and therefore people did not have something pushing them into considering revolution. And the Land Act of Balfour of 1903 actually is one of the few, uh, you know, Catholics can point at and go, actually, this kind of helps us. And the fact the state was doing something to help the Catholics doesn't hurt their loyalty to some extent. So up until 1910 we see yes there's a slow bubbling growth particularly in a long-term sense of Irish pride and Irish nationalism which is essential to have a truly national revolutionary movement but in reality there's nothing to say that in 1910 there will be an explosion of violence except what happens next is there's an explosion of violence. So the big thing which turns this into an issue is the constitutional crisis of 1909. Essentially, as a result of it, two forces which massively increase the arguments and the power of the Irish nationalists happen. Number one, the House of Lords are destroyed as a political force, which means that they can only delay the Home Rule legislation rather than veto it. What this means is the common argument, the argument that the Liberals have been using since 1890 to basically Sort of avoid having a discussion about home rule with the Irish nationalists, which was, there's no point, the House of Lords will block it, does not work anymore. And likewise, in the, as a result of the 1910 elections, particularly the December one, the Liberals have to have the Irish MPs' support in order to stay in government. So now, the Irish have leverage, and the Liberals don't have an excuse. So naturally, very quickly, it becomes clear that there's going to be home rule. Now, interestingly, what leads to an escalation of the tensions is as much the Protestant reaction to this notion, this idea, this, this change, as it is the Irish themselves. Because in reality, pretty much straight away, um, even without the Home Rule Bill being published formally, although it was mooted, um, we see that the Protestants react. And this arguably will create a circle of tension, a circle of hostility. So what we should do, and when we consider how this escalates, is always understand that both sides are deeply hostile to each other and deeply suspicious. Now they have existed in an uneasy peace and essentially deliberately avoid integrating themselves for too much and encouraged each other to um, avoid any tension, but essentially they have lived in peace. Now the only thing that's going to disturb that peace is if you think the other side are now planning to kill you, as you can imagine. So when one side starts or organising, that will make the other side incredibly nervous because logically they go, well, why are they organising? Why are they changing the status quo? And the only explanation that when you combine the generations of massacres and race hate um, is the um, conclusion that, well, obviously they are about to launch an attack on us. So the of inevitable reaction to that is then to organise yourself. But then that makes the other side say, well, they're organising. Where are they? We were organising for self-defence, but now they are organising. That means that they are a threat. We need to then escalate by arming ourselves. And this turns into a sort of cycle of destruction, etc. 
So um, what we see is pretty much as a reaction, the Ulster Orange Lodges, which are the orange, orange, orange or, or, lodges, orange lodges, not spelt like that, um, uh, are which have been existent in existence for decades, well, centuries, in, in fact, in some cases, um, get together and very quickly organise a solemn leave and co league and covenant. Now, this is ostensibly a political force. This is about unifying all Protestants so that they all work together and that the community is strong. And you can argue that because they're the vast minority of the island, that you need to, in order to be effective and strong and, and be able to defend yourselves and not be isolated and picked off, you need to organise. So, you can argue what this does is this raises the temperature to some extent um, because the idea that they're mobilizing shows clear opposition to home rule. There's no reason they would organize unless they want home rule to stop. And the problem is, how are they going to stop it? That implies violence to a greater or lesser extent. And more than that, it does sort of encourage anger amongst the Catholics who say, who finally see things going their way and then see the, Catholic, the Protestants actively trying to avoid um, and agitate against this thing which they see as fair. So what it does is it really spoils the relationship to some extent because it shows that there is still this um, sectarian rivalry between the two groups, but also lead, leads to an edge of fear. And this is not help, helped by the fact that um, shortly afterwards, the Ulster volunteers, who are in technically separate to the Solomon Co Covenants, but in reality it's the same people in both, um, are created. And these are an armed force designed for quote-unquote self-defence, and they parade publicly in Protestant areas. Now this is clearly a show of strength and a show of force, and now what's happened is weapons have been brought into this debate. The resistance to home rule, if you just look at the Sodom and Covenant, could, if you want to be generous, just be political. It might just be letter writing and petitioning. But there is no excuse to have an armed force as a political tool. The only thing one can reasonably con um, uh, concede from that, or believe from that, is that they will use force to resist home rule, or arguably even use that, those guns against their Catholic neighbours. And so this really escalates tensions and that really escalates anger amongst um, the Irish, who then in turn lead, end up, as you should see, organising their own things, joining Sinn Féin rather than the nationalists, because the nationalists are all too moderate. But the voice of moderation in times of a, such extreme escalations of tensions never really go down well. Um, and so what this all causes is it's almost a spiral of violence. Now, this is only made worse by the Conservatives. The concern, new Conservative leader, Bonalore, has come in because he's a no one, essentially. He spent most of his life in Canada, and so no one really knows what he believes. He seems like a nice chap, though, so they all picked him because he's not, no one knows if he's a free trader or a, or a protectionist. And he has two jobs. At no point ever bring up free trade or protectionism. Okay, don't bring it up because it just causes division. And number two, reunite the court Tory party. Now, the, an easy way to reunite them is to take a very public, or some would say controversial stand on an issue which all the Conservatives kind of agree with. And the obvious issue is Ireland. All Conservatives, to some extent, believe that Ireland should be um, ruled by Britain and were instinctively hostile to home rule. Bonner Law wants to send the message that, uh, and get the Tories to rally around this idea. And if they've rallied around that, it will help knit together this unity. It's a clever play. Bonner Law doesn't necessarily care that much about um, Ireland, the one way or the other. I mean, he's a conservative, so he's instinctively against it, but not that much. But he makes the point to go over um, and, in a speech, um, essentially say that armed resistance of the Protestants is justifiable. Now, his exact wording is a little bit more Weasley than that. It's the idea of um, the argument, essentially, that... Um, he can't envision a situation in which um, he wouldn't support what the Ulster men were doing, i.e. because of that he knows that there's violence, and therefore he's kind of saying that violence is something that he would accept. Now this causes a huge scandal and the, the Liberals attack the Conservative Party were not being stoking the tensions, etc, etc, etc. But arguably this was really good for Bonner Law because the Tories, when they're getting attacked by the Liberals, all rally around and go, no, 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 Mom, Mr Law is right, blah, 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 blah. And what that means is then the Tories have this unity. So it's a nice play by Bonner Law there. What it does do as well, though, is it really bolsters the confidence of the Ulster volunteers. They feel that like they have such a powerful political party having their back and giving them a blank check to do whatever they want really drives home this idea that, that they could perhaps resist 
um, home rule if they put um, as they see fit. And it really uh, simultaneously angers and alienates the, the Irish who see a double standard in the British government. And although the um, Conservative government are not in the British government, that distinction is often lost in the provinces of um, Ireland. They represent the English Westminster elite. And it doesn't matter who is in charge, all they see is one of them is saying this, and therefore they are clearly all against this, as it were. So this really stokes and escalates attention, and it's really Bonalore doing that for political reason. Bonalore is actually a reasonable chap, but he, this is seen as, even by his biographers, as perhaps a little bit too much of a crass, opportunist, opportunistic move. On top of this, there is the Quran mutiny. Now, the Quran mutiny, um, you have to research in your own time, but essentially the British arm, officers of the British army say they are not going to fight against the Ulstermen, and the British um, Secretary of Defence says OK. Now, this clearly shows favouritism again, and this clearly emboldens the Ulstermen. If the army refuses to do what it is told for political reasons and gets away with it on this issue, then this clearly shows the government is biased towards the Ulstermen and towards the Protestants. This in turn makes the Protestants naturally, they, they're more confident the army won't actually deal with them very much. There's also, also lots of secret contacts between them and the army at this point anyway. Um, and it emboldens them to push and be more aggressive. And it also alienates and gives arguments, gives weight to the argument of Sinn Féin that Britain will, is naturally biased. You will never even in home rule, get true equality because they seek so clearly favour the Protestants, as you have seen by Bonner Law, the Kuramusni, and the fact that these um, Ulster volunteers have been created and no one's done anything about them, even though they've got guns and they're on the street, which is not allowed. Um, and therefore, it really adds to a massive drift towards support, um, towards the um, uh, Sinn Féin movement. And this is why in the next election, the Irish nationalists will be wiped out and replaced by Sinn Féin. And as you can imagine, this then leads to an escalation because that means the dominant power in Irish Catholicism, it, and therefore the Irish state, is Sinn Féin, who are far more radical, far more willing to use violence, etc., etc., etc. So essentially, this, all this rhetoric really helps the Sinn Féin movement and hurts the Irish nationalists. The Irish nationalists have spent 40 years, in theory, making the, um, M their argument was they're helping make the MPs come around to the idea of Irish nationalism and Irish independence, or home rule at least, and this has been so proven untrue by the Karal Mutiny and proven untrue by the actions of Bonner Law. So in return, the Irish then dis um, form the Dublin Volunteers as an ostensibly self-defence movement. I, they had the same thing as the Ulster Volunteers, they organise themselves, they train with weapons, they parade, and Again, it's the idea of protecting themselves from what they see as the Protestant aggression. Now, obviously, the Protestants see this as Irish aggression, um, of Catholic aggression, and so then they thought escalate themselves and they thought become more radical, more militant, which in turn leads to the doubling of volunteers, etc., etc. And it really, really kickstarts and continues this cycle of hatred and violence. So the tensions are escalating all the way through. And um, by the... Um, uh, 19, by 1914, it looks like this is going to descend into violence. And in reality, it probably should have descended into violence. Um, uh, the last trigger, which arguably could have been a trigger had the World War I not started a few days later, was um, there were two different gun running incidents where guns were imported, because there weren't many guns in Ireland at this point, guns were imported into Ireland. The Ulster um, uh, gun running, where the government seemingly did nothing. Now, in reality, it was the local police and the local authorities who were naturally sympathetic to Protestants, um, allowed the guns in, and the, the local police did not try and stop it, even though it was public knowledge. And this got out in the press, and it was very clear, like, the, lo um, the local elite had helped the um, uh, Ulstermen get their guns in. But to the Catholics, they didn't make the distinction between local elites and government. For them, they saw the government refusing to intervene and allowing the Ulstermen to get guns. Compare this with their own gun-running exercise a couple of days later, which is stopped by British troops, British soldiers are sent in, uh, in the process stones are thrown and um, an Irishman is killed. And argue this is a, this is a trigger, this should trigger an, an, an uprising. And this leads to a massive increase in tension in the idea that the government is clearly unfair. And the problem with the government being seen as unfair, the only logical response, therefore, is revolution, is violence, is rebellion. And the fact that someone's being killed by British troops while the British government are being unfair starts really triggers a lot of hostility, a lot of people sympathise with Sinn Féin, and really 
like epitomizes for people, and people need this. People don't naturally believe something, but they need it. If, you know, think about um, uh, the refugee crisis. Oh, I'm just going to be dated, but the refugee crisis and the, the young child who died on the beach. Loads of people died, but as soon as there is an epitomized um, image that people can latch onto, the crisis transforms in the public mentality. Same thing. As soon as someone gets shot because of the unfair biasness, and there's so clear two cases, two completely different responses, this really focuses the public mind. And this really starts generating hostility and generating support for some sort of violent action. And you can argue, had this been left to run, then we would see violence very shortly afterwards. Now, before we look on what stopped this from boiling over, or lance this boil, we should really focus on who's to blame. Now, um, this is, tends to be the focus of most of the questions of this query. Not necessarily all of them. They can ask why did it escalate, but we cover that. But they, can, they often, very often, more often, will ask about who is to blame. Now, obviously, a, a clear group to blame are the Austin and Protestants. Um, they arguably escalated this by um, uh, essentially forming a covenant, which triggered it, forming the Austin volunteers, which triggered it, and, and basically taking them and pushing stuff. But in defense of them, you can point out, well, this is maybe not a defence, you can point out that the status quo had benefited them, but for them it looked like the status quo, and therefore any change to the status quo, i.e. home rule, suddenly threatens their entire lives and livelihoods. And in their conception of what the world would look like under a Catholic-dominated world, there is a real historical fear of the massacres, historical fear of the oppression of religious rights that will come with that. And even if it's unfounded, and they did not believe it was unfounded, for them, they were genuinely believing that they were defending their lives and their liberty. So you can argue that, yes, clearly they were escalating this situation, but it isn't necessarily cynical. It does come from a very, very passionate place. And even if it's arguing misguided, it is still their logic. So they're not going, ha, 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 okay, this is a great excuse. They are believing that this is what needs to be done to protect themselves and their family. Okay? Similarly, because they had the massacred lots. Similarly, you can argue that the Irish nationalists were responsible, and the Catholic nationalists, sorry, either the ineptitude of the Irish nationalists, the extremism of the Sinn Féin movement, who were more than happy to use these different crises and generate and publicise the, the problems and the um, unfairness in order to aggravate people. Like, they didn't have to. The Irish nationalists deliberately did not really talk about all the inequalities and all the bad things, because they knew it would cause the average Irish person to resist, and that would cause violence, and that would hurt the cause. But the Sinn Féin movement have no um, concerns about that in any way, shape or form. Um, and they really stoke it. And they are the ones who organise the various Dublin volunteers and they uh, organise the gun running. So you can see they are contributing to the escalation. The Irish nationalists, the Catholic nationalists, um, arguably are, have, their weakness was they lost the confidence of the average, number, the average Irish person. Their, their story of moderation had not achieved enough had not impressed enough Irish people, and therefore really did not get enough support, and therefore meant that people naturally and easily slid over to the um, Sinn Féin movement in supporting them. You can argue it was the British government, who are um, weakly managing the tensions. They should have been stronger against the Protestants um, to limit the escalation. They should have been stronger against um, uh, and allowing the uh, the Quran mutiny, and they should be stronger against the gun running in um, in the north of the Protestants. But in reality, they fire the head of the Minister of Defence as a result of the Quran mutiny, and they do start an investigation, although the war interrupts it, about who is to blame for allowing the guns in um, to give them to Protestants. Um, so they cannot be entirely to blame. You can argue that they mishandle the escalating situation as opposed to probably trigger it. The Conservative Party, particularly Bonner Law, really adds to the tension that uh, his act intervention both emboldens and, um, the Protestants, which only makes things worse, and also really helps create a um, feeling amongst the Catholics, which is exploited ruthlessly by the Sinn Féin movement, that the English are naturally against the Irish, and they will never truly treat the Catholics the same, and therefore independence is the only way forward, therefore don't support the Irish nationalists, support us. So the actions of law are really damaging on two fronts, in emboldening the Ulster volunteers, but also in giving ammunition to the Sinn Féin movement to radicalise the Irish people. You can also argue that actually Yes, these groups are contributing, but this conflict was inevitable. Uh, essentially, Home Rule had, lived, had existed in an artificial status since in the 1890s, arguably since the uh, last um, rebellion um, with the Irish Republican Brotherhood. 
And actually, all that was waiting was another rebellion. Because nothing materially had changed since the last rebellion, um, there, the forces, the social economic inequality, the deep distrust between um, the two sectarian groups, the <coughs> Um, clearly biased approach of the British government and the lack of a long term how are we going to transform this into something which is less likely to blow up into violence does, doesn't happen and therefore we can argue that there was an inevitability yet again of all inevitability arguments did it have to happen then did it have to happen exactly like it did probably not but the idea that ultimately Ireland it says not a surprise Ireland goes into violence again because all the forces which create violence have not been changed since last time is of quite a strong one. And you can argue, therefore, what, or what's happening is the stasis which had kept the peace, this uneasy artificial status quo, broke down. But it was always going to break down. You cannot keep that forever. There was always going to be something like that. It just happened to be the 1905, sorry, 1909 constitutional crisis. Now, what stops it from boiling over there and then is 1914. Britain declares war. Um, the Catholics and Protestant um, buy in, many of them, not all of them, buy into the idea of patriotic zeal fighting for the government although there's more Ulstermen than um, uh, Catholics because uh, the, the centre of being a Protestant in, in Ireland was about identifying with the crown and therefore there's a lot more patriotism plus there's an argument that if they do this they will prove their worth and therefore fight against the home rule um, and they join the war and so what you have is a combination of lots of young men leaving the country which only helps avoid re rebellion and also you see a um, uh, a patriotic fervour and sense of unity which avoids the question. They do not like each other. The uni this, this war does not lead to unity between the Catholic Protestants. It leads to unity between the um, Protestants and the British government and an uneasy peace between the Catholics and the British government. So it doesn't solve the problem. It just puts it off. Um, in 1914, in fact, Home Rule is actually passed. It, it's, it's proposed once, it's rejected, proposed twice, it's rejected. In 1914, it's the third reading and it can't be rejected, so it passes. But in order to keep the peace, under the excuse that we need to focus on the war, they suspend it for duration of the war. This gives the Ulsterman an opportunity to continue it being suspended after the war. Because even if, however temporary you say something is suspended, you can keep it as suspended for as long as you want. You can always find an excuse to suspend it. So. In reality, the immediate build-up of tension is lanced, stopped. However, in the long term, Sinn Féin and the political movement and the increased sense of injustice and the propaganda and the sense of Irish nationalism, which has been growing as a result of Sinn Féin, only grows during the war. And actually, the government can't really pay attention to this because it's focusing on a major war. And so we see the Easter Rising in 1916 and a government action which is seen as very brutal in many circles, which clearly, although it has temporarily dealt with the um, crisis, and you should read around the Easter Rising in your own time, um, actually will just mean that the hostility towards the government just remains. So in reality, with 1914, what we see is, yes, there is a temporary peace based on patriotism, but it does not lead to unity. It does not lead to people forgetting about the divisions. And in reality, it only gives space for the Sinn Féin to grow, grow and the actions during the war only makes that worse. So that is the Irish question. You need to make sure you are able to explain what forces shape it into happening and then who is to blame. Um, this is the end of the pre-1914 stuff. We will go on to World War One, and then that's just the end of part one of the exam paper.